I have two props. Uh, this prop if, uh, is uh, if I lose my way in what I'm going to say. This prop is if I lose your attention. <laughs> so I'll put them right there. Uh, I'm not on the teleprompter, so to speak. Um, she just said, if you don't know where you came from, you will not know where you are going. I could not agree more. I want to talk about memory, but really I want to talk about frames. I want to talk about you, me, us. I want to talk about what's in here. I want to talk about what's out there and how we deal with what's out there when it goes in here. And I want to talk about how much awakefulness in our lives that we can actually bear. Um, there's computers. There's computers in the camera. There's computers back there. There's computers that are running this software program. The computer, the computer and the brain are sort of interesting. The inside of both is about 1.3 kilograms, 1.4 kilograms, you know, the hard drive, the processors, whatever. The computer needs as much formatting as our brain needs frames. So the computer can't deal, the computer deals with nothing but zeros and ones, pouring in, pouring out, streams them, zeros and ones, that's all it gets. And the brilliancy of, of applications and formatting, it takes these zeros and ones and it changes them into photographs, it changes them into, into text, it changes them into music. And without that formatting, all the zeros and ones that stream into all these computers and your cell phones that are on right now is nothing but zeros and ones. It's the formatting that forms it and makes it into things. So in here, we are bombarded by sensory, sensory things, eyes, ears, taste, feeling, bombarding into our brain in electromagnetic impulses, just like zeros and ones. So how does this make sense of all the impulses? It formats them, it frames them, it has to. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of meaningless electromagnetic impulses pouring into this computer, so to speak. And so what I'm saying is the frame, your memories, that you actually think is a memory of what something actually happened or what you learned in class or what someone told you about history, you think that's actually the memory. Well, no, no, you framed it. You framed it, and you put it in, you stored it. And I want to talk about the frames, but first I just want you to take a second, go back to uh, a strong personal memory. It could be anything. It could be a four-second memory. It could be a 20-second memory. And just pick out that memory. So, yeah, I've got one. Okay. So just park that up there for a second. I want to talk about the frame. So the memory or the information you put in a frame. And the reason why I'm standing here, all these cameras, is because I think the frame can actually be more powerful than the memory. I think the way the frame is arranged, who arranged it, actually can take over the memory. And that's why we need to talk about the frame, so to speak. Uh, you can frame anything. You can frame politics. John Tory is going to appear later. You can frame memory. You can frame information. Uh, the most obvious example is the oil sands. So let's take the oil sands. You can frame it any number of ways. You can frame the oil sands as Canada's energy future. We are an energy superpower. Our economy depends on it. We have tens of thousands of jobs created in Ontario and across. It's going to be amazing. And this is actually what's going to propel our economy into the 22nd century. You can frame the oil sands as the tar sands. You can frame it as uh, a carbon, what is it, 15% more carbon per, uh, per barrel of oil, so to speak, from, from the oil sands, uh, that it's an ecological problem, that we're heading into climate change, that we have to reduce our emissions, not raise our emissions, that accelerating, the, the, the accelerating or tripling the size of the oil sands is in fact somewhere where we can't go because we have to deal with climate change, we have to deal with our next generations. Those are two radically different frames. And where does your memory and information about what's happening out there sit? You made the frame. So I have three questions. Who made the frame? First, no, first question, do you know the frame is there? Can you recognize the frame that you put around each of those things? Second is, who made the frame? Did you make it? Or is it someone else's frame you just have? You just accepted it. And third, what are you going to do about it? Are you always ready to see reality, situations, memory, history through frames? 
So those are the three, and the whole framing of the world of your experience goes from micro to macro. I mean, micro, what's in here? Uh, I'm thinking of a, a guy on a, a, he phoned me up on a, on a telemarketing thing, and you know, I said, yeah, can you tell me the company? Can you tell me the company you're speaking from? He said, no, 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 I said, but I have to know. He said, shut your mouth. I said, but you have to tell me the company. Shut your mouth. You have to tell me, the I'll have this conversation with you, but please tell me the company you're phoning. Shut your mouth. So I have a very distinct memory of that, and I put that in a number of frames. So, but memory goes huge. Framing goes huge. It goes to the universe. It goes to history. We frame history. So if we frame the oil sands, and what are we going to do with as Canadians? You frame history. So how do you frame history? Where do you take that? Whose frame? Does history depend on the historian who's telling it? Is there objective history? So in this context, I want to talk about a project we call the World Remembers, because we're coming up to the centenary of World War I. World War I was an enormous event. It changed the modern world. It took the term civilization away from Europe because they killed nine and a half million in four and a half years. Uh, the World War I ended back in the same town that it started. And we're going into the centenary years of this. So how do we remember war? How do we remember the First World War? How do we remember what we did politically, what we did militarily? And there's a number of different frames. You start thinking of them right now. So we're trying to create a project called The World Remembers, which we will create. And we're saying we want to address the centenary years for Canada without a frame. How do you do that? Everything I set up to now. I mean, I mean you can go, you say, wait a minute. Not all frames are subjective. There's got to be an objective frame. And the naughty part of me says, no, there's no objective frame. Yeah, 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 OK. Uh, you know, I learned when I grew up, objective frame, that's up and that's down. Come on, we all agree, don't we? That's up and that's down, otherwise you're loony. No. If I'm 14 hours away and I'm in Canberra, Australia, that's down and that's up at this very moment. If I'm in Baghdad, that's up and that's down. And if I'm in Hawaii, that's up and that's down right now. There is no objective frame you can hang on to. It's all who in the frame, and where are you? So this is the world remembers, and we want to remember the people who were killed in World War I. But how do we do that without a frame? So we call it Le Monde Se Souvient, and we called it Il Mondo Record. And we call it <coughs> Die Welt erinnert sich. So already I'm pushing your frame around. Wait a minute, the world remembers. The Germans, the world remembers. Dutch, Belgium. Already I'm asking you to look at the frames of World War I and the world remembers. These are all the titles for our project. It's the same thing, the world remembers. Irish. The world remembers, Chinese. 3,000 Chinese were killed. 3,000 Chinese were killed. And the Chinese that were killed almost all came across Canada on the trains from Vancouver from China. Do we remember that? Do we include the frame of history of World War I, of Canadian history, to include that? Is this a usual World War I photograph? No, these are Australian troops. Australian troops, what's this? Hungarian. Wait a minute. So if I put Hungarian right after the Australian troops, I'm thinking of the Australians in a different way. Are these Hungarian? No, they're Canadian. This picture was taken by my godmother. These are Canadian troops in, who are wounded in the hospital in the south of England. So I'm trying to push your frames around. I'm trying to say push the frame that you've set on what you're going to do about World War I in Canada. Push it around. Belgians, 1914. Serbian, Canadians. We want to remember the people, and we want to remember them without, without as, as few frames as we can. This is taken in Toronto. This is taken at the Canadian National Exhibition. Who are these men? These are Canadians. These are German Canadians. So this uh, is the project is to try to, how do we address the World War I and the centenary in Canada's involvement in the loss of 68,000 people? What do we do? Italian troops fighting in, the, in Slovenia, Italy, in the north of the, this is the usual picture. This is back within the usual frame. Ah, World War I, yes, muds, trenches, 
Yes, it was. It was terrible, mud and trenches. This is the usual picture. Well, usual. It killed nine and a half million. Australians in Turkey, air crew. Mm. Dog. How many animals were killed in World War I? The frame that you put on memory, the frame that you put on history does many things. It tries to control it, right? Like the zeros and ones coming into a computer. I got to deal with all that information. A frame can also deal with terror. It can deal with fear. It can deal with mystery. It can deal with incomprehension. We have to be able to comp comprehend our lives in order to move forward. So how do I deal with the big frame? Look at the universe. How do you deal with a big universe? What? We're, uh, <laughs> well, our species has been around, what? I think we're less than 100,000 years, our species. Uh, we're one of our 400 million years of living history on this earth, which is uh, 3 billion years in a universe that is uh, 13 and a half billion years long. Uh, we are in a small planet by a medium star on the outer edge of one of the smaller galaxies. There may be 300 billion stars in our galaxy, and there are maybe 400 billion galaxies. How do you deal with that? I mean, my life, hopefully, I may be 80 or 90 years old. When I die, you may be 30, you may be 50, and you're like that. So how do you deal with that? Oh, you shut it out. Oh, you forget it. What, how do you deal with that? You put it in a frame. You put it in a frame of meaning. You put it in a frame of purpose. If I said, all your lives here are purposeless, I've got six minutes, I've got to go. All your lives are purposeless. You can't deal with that. You have to have purpose. So a frame can get purpose. A frame can put memory. A frame can put meaning. Uh, the, Judo uh, the Abrahamic uh, religions put the creation story and said, we are the center. You know, the world was made for us, the universe was made for us, we are the king, you have purpose, you have meaning. That was to put comfort and meaning on what is meaningless. Not meaningless, but what is terrifying and is incomprehensible. Which is war. So the World War I, just so we know, went through three historical periods of talking about it. With the 1920s, when they wrote the history of World War I, it was all rah-rah. It was, this was great. Yes, millions were killed, but we fought for freedom. We brought back our culture. You know, it was culture versus humanity. We were the humanity. The Germans were the culture. You know, we succeeded that. And that history lasted for about 10 to 15 years. And at the end of the 30s, in the 20s, the the warrior's journal started to arrive, the soldiers who wrote their journals, and those books started to be published, and the poetry started to be, the poetry from the soldiers started to appear, and then lo and behold, you have in the 60s, you have the history of World War I swings the other way. It was a total waste. The generals didn't know what they were doing. They should have been put on trial. Uh, Douglas Haig uh, High School should not be called Douglas Haig High School because he was a butcher, and the whole history changed that way. And in the 90s, the history, talking about frames, the history changed back that way which was more, more balanced. It was a learning curve, whatever it led to. So again, the history in which you learn these events shifts. So where are you, so to speak? Belgium refugees. Czech, the Czech armored train. Do we talk about Canada in the World War I? Do we talk about it from a political point of view, from a military point of view? from a social history point of view, almost every army in World War I revolted at some point. I'll say that again. Almost every army in World War I revolted at some point. What was that about? Is this framed? It might be. This might be staged, actually. I'm not sure the Germans are actually digging the graves. We never tell the history of war through pain, because the men don't talk of it. Why not? not manly. Man up. The only people who tell the history of pain in the war are the women. It's the nurses who wrote about the pain and the screams of the soldiers. It was the nurses who wrote about the fear of the young men. We don't talk about that. We don't put that in the frame. There's a nurse's account of their rage at a young woman. They prepared these guys who were so, their skulls were blown and all the rest of it, and the plastic surgery was not there, and the nurse's greatest fear uh, was when the girlfriend would arrive and meet the young wounded soldiers for the first time and they prepared the young woman. They said, you have to understand he's changed, whatever. And they desperately, sorry, get emotional. They desperately did not want the young woman, to, the girlfriend, to add to the man's problems. And then there would be a special little room. They would usher the girlfriend in. And then in the worst case scenario, they heard screams, her screams. And the nurses were livid 
that that young woman would scream at what she saw had been her boyfriend and could not contain that. No one talks about the pain of World War I. So this is us. This is the world remembers. We want to talk about the people. We want to remember them name by name. We want to put as few frames on it as possible. So that means we name the Canadians. That means we name the British. That means we name the Belgians. That means we name the Germans. That means we name the French. That means we name the Australians. And we say they're equal. They're all equal in death. You make the frame when you watch the project. You decide what context you're going to put those names into. And we will put a Canadian name here, and we will put a German name here, and we will put an Australian name here. The, uh, we just got a phone call from uh, Turkey this morning. Uh, Turkey has just decided to join one of the six nations who will, join the, who will run this project. So the Turkish names will be 770,000 Turkish names. So what frame do we take? And we said we don't want a frame. We want you to make the frame of what you think about World War I what you think about the loss of 68,000 Canadians, what do you think about the loss of nine and a half million, not the six million civilians, because we can't get that data. So we will name them over the centenary years. It's a massive project, we need help, the world remembers .ca. Because it is so massive, what we do is we time every name. So if your name is William Webster, William Webster, his family can go on the website and type in Webster, it'll say what army, and it'll say Canadian army, and uh, here comes, there's probably 42 Websters, and you'll look down and you'll see Robert C. Webster, your great uncle. And they'll say, Robert C. Webster was killed in uh, 1914. His name will appear 2014, November the 2nd, at 12.06 a.m. So the Webster family knows exactly when to watch, whether in Berlin or Australia. And because the William Webster's family's name appears at 12.06 a.m., he's 12.06 in a.m. in Berlin, an hour later, he's 12.06 in London, in Brit British schools. Four hours later, he's in Halifax at 12.06. Then he's in Toronto at 12.06 an hour later. An hour later in Winnipeg, an hour later. And we actually make each of the dead stand up where they were killed and walk around the world. And so 100 years after, we want to have the names walk the world and be accessible to us all. You can watch it online, you can watch it at school. We hope the Crescent School is going to do it. We hope the Crescent School will join it. We give this to schools so they can show it as part of their educational thing. We stream it online. We'll do a large national display. The city of Calgary wants to do it. The Germans are going to do it. And so together we say, let's remember them. Because the greatest fear of those who came back from World War I was they would be forgotten. And for 99 years, we have named them as a collective. We honorably remember them. And we want to say what the world remembers, we remember William, André, Slovan, Remember them. They all had mothers who wept. They all had families who, did, who lived after. And that's the purpose of the project. It's a Canadian idea because it's inclusive. And inclusive is trying to push back all those frames that land on everything. So really the talk is about frames. It's, it talks about what's in here, what's out there, and how we deal with it. And looking th through the First World War. And as your exercise, as you go home, before I put on the hat, you can look at the little personal memory that I asked you about and see if you can figure out the frame and how much wakefulness you want, how much wakefulness you can bear in your life to deal with all these enormous questions that are coming down. Thank you very much.